Well, the modern atom, the, the map of the atom as, as an atomic nucleus with electrons going around it, that was only discovered at the start of the 20th century um, in Manchester, amongst other places. Ernest Rutherford famously uh, discovered the atomic nucleus. So that this idea of the atom as a solar system is a 20th century idea. Um, if you go back just to the turn of the 20th century, there were debates about the, there's something called the plum pudding model, which had it that, that all the, the positively charged matter was, was like a cake with the electrons embedded in the cake as little raisins in a pudding. And the electron itself was only discovered in 1897 as a particle. So, so we're talking really about a 20th century science, although the idea of a fundamental building blocks dates back to the Greeks, that's where the word comes from. The, 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 the map we learn of at school is a 20th century idea. And then, but immediately you have this solar system model of an atom. So you have a, a, a positively charged atomic nucleus with basically all the mass in it, with electrons going around it. You get severe problems. It was known at the time when, when that model was first put forward by Niels Bohr and others, that the electrons moving around the positive thing should radiate. Uh, radiate electromagnetic waves, so lose energy. And this is, a, this is the way that a television transmitter works. So it's, electrons shake around and they radiate electromagnetic waves off. So that was immediately a problem. The answer lies in quantum theory, which is really in, in its modern form, a 1920s innovation uh, with Schrodinger and others. Um, and then actually in its more, in even more modern form called quantum field theory, which is the, the, the merger of quantum mechanics with special relativity. That's a, I suppose, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s. It ultimately, you get to this picture we have today called the standard model of particle physics, which, which describes how, um, until last year, I would have said 12 fundamental particles. There's now Higgs as well, which we've discovered almost certainly, but not absolutely shown to be the case yet, the, the so-called standard model Higgs. Um, and the three forces of nature that stick them together. Um, gravity sits outside the standard model because it's so weak, basically. It's very hard to, to experimentally probe gravity at atomic scales. In fact, it's not been done uh, yet. So, so we don't know how it fits into that structure. So we've got, we've got this beautifully simple picture of matter. Um, Twelve matter particles stuck together by three forces, and then this other particle called the Higgs particle um, which gives them mass. So um, we can talk about that if you'd like. It's a very complicated and wonderful and, uh, well, actually, it's not very complicated. It's quite easy to explain. So let me just give you the picture. There are 12 matter particles. Um, we, that's me and the Earth, and in fact, every star you can see in the sky and every galaxy you can see in the sky is made of three of them. So there are two quarks called up and down quarks, uh, a proton, basically is made of two up quarks and a down quark, and a neutron is made of two down quarks and an up quark, with a lot of added complication, depending on how carefully you look at it. Essentially, two ups and a down for the proton, two downs and an up for the neutron, um, and then there are electrons that go around them. So you need three particles to make up atoms, which makes up me and everything we can see in the universe. There's one other particle called the neutrino, which is um, involved in something called radioactive beta decay. It, it comes into play when the weak nuclear force is acting. Uh, also involved in the way that stars shine. So the sun converts hydrogen into helium. Uh, in order to convert hydrogen into helium, it has to take protons, which are the nuclei of hydrogen, and convert them into neutrons, which go into the nucleus of helium. That proceeds via the action of what's called the weak nuclear force, and neutrinos are emitted when that force acts in that way. So neutrinos are streaming out from the sun, uh, something like 60 billion per square centimetre passing through your head every second from the sun. So copious numbers of these things. So that's what you seem to need to build a universe. We have the up quarks and the down quarks, the electron and the so-called electron neutrino. Four particles. Nature has seen fit to make two further copies of those particles, which are identical in every way to the basic four, except they're more massive. Um, why nature chose to do that, we don't know. Uh, we have reasonably good evidence from experiments at CERN in the 80s that there aren't any more uh, of those standard matter particles. So we've got three generations or three families of particles. Um, 
as I say, no idea why that pattern exists. There will be a reason. It's, it's almost like the periodic table, uh, which was, you know, in, in, in the 19th century was a clue to the structure of atoms. There's a clue there to the structure of some underlying theory, but we don't know what it is. So yeah, 12 particles of matter. Higgs particle. Um, and the Higgs particle works by essentially filling the vacuum of empty space. So it's often referred to as a condensate, a Higgs condensate. The theory goes that less than a billionth of a second after the Big Bang, as the universe expanded and cooled, then the Higgs field condensed out into empty space. So really, in a similar fashion, as it's, we often refer to it as a phase change, or it's a similar fashion to a water vapor condensing out onto a window on a cold winter's day. So you get what's called a phase change. You get water vapor um, cooling down and it being more energetically favorable for it to turn into ice. So it changes from vapor into ice. Well, in the same way, the Higgs field condensed into the vacuum of empty space as the universe expanded and cooled. And the other particles, the electrons and the quarks, get their mass by interacting with that Higgs field. So quite, quite literally, sort of rattling through the Higgs field in the vacuum, if you like. Um, that's correct. Now, we, as far as we can tell, we've discovered something that, as I speak, so in, in sort of spring 2013, it, we've discovered something at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN that looks very much like that Higgs particle. It, it almost certainly is. There's more precision measurements to be done to find out if it is the so-called standard model Higgs and which Higgs it is, if not. And, but it's almost certainly a Higgs particle. I would love to be wrong, as would all particle physicists, but it looks like it is. So, so, so there's the full set. So when we talk about the, the structure of matter, uh, it's, it's, it's gone from being a, quite a simple idea, these indivisible parts, to a, a rather more subtle, still simple, but rather more subtle picture of these 12 matter particles, the Higgs particle, and then the, the, the particles that carry the forces. Just for completeness, I'll tell you what they are. There's a photon, which carries the electromagnetic force. There are gluons, in fact, eight of them. So I refer to them as one, but there are eight different kinds of them, uh, which carry the strong force. And then three particles called the W plus, the W minus, and the Z bosons that carry the weak force. And that's it.